Okay, let's look at scenario two. It looks like there was a denial of service attack that was reported against our FTP server 192.168.56.1. And it also seems like there was some FTP traffic spikes that were seen prior to the FTP server being taken offline. So what do we know? We know the address of the attacker, 192.168.56.101, and the address of the FTP server, 56.1. But what are we trying to figure out? This one's a little bit more abstract. So generally, what we want to find out is what caused the spike in the FTP traffic and what events took place prior to the FTP server being taken offline. So were any files transferred? Were any user accounts compromised? Things like that. So let's take a look. Before we get started, we always want to make sure that we document our goals, steps, and results. In this scenario, our goals are a little bit more abstract and will depend on what we find in the PCAP. In the meantime, we at least know what types of things that we're looking for. Indicators of compromise. So let's start with what happened before, during, and after the attack on the FTP server. So in this case, we want to know what led up to the attack, what types of attacks did the attacker perform, and were they able to get in, and what did they find? Okay, so now that we have our goals written down, let's open the PCAP. Whoa, that's a lot of ARP frames being sent. Looking at the info column, we can see that in most of these ARP requests, the IP address is going up for each request. This looks like an ARP scan being sent off by 56.101 here, the attacker address. It might be a little crazy to sort through all of the requests here, so first, let's take a look at how many conversations are within the capture file to begin with so that we see exactly how many IP addresses are in this. We can do that by going to Statistics and then Conversations. Looking at the IPv4 tab, the only IPs that we see are our 56.1 and .101 addresses that we were already aware of. That's good. It means that this capture file was already filtered down for us. Glancing over at our TCP tab, we can also see over 7,000 TCP connections were made just between these two addresses. We're not going to find anything interesting in there right away, so let's make a mental note of that and move on. Now, we already know that this capture file only has two IP addresses, but even with that, we want to look through the attack traffic and try to find out what the attacker was able to see on our network. Let's look at the ARP scans again. ARP scans work by sending out a bunch of ARP requests throughout the network. The idea is that when another device on the network receives an ARP request, it will send an ARP reply. So let's filter this down to show only the ARP replies. Okay, cool. We have the 56.1 and .101 that we expected. But there's a third address, .100. We don't have any information on it, so it's possible there was no communication from the attacker at all, or it could have been filtered out from the capture. Either way, let's make a note of this and move on. At this point, we're done with the ARP traffic, so let's filter that out. Now we're starting to see a flood of packets coming from our attacker, and based on the changing port numbers, this is pretty obviously a network port scan. So it looks like we're going to have to do the same thing again. From here, how can we figure out what open ports the attacker was able to find in their scan of the system? Well, we already know that when we send out a SYN, we expect to see a SYNAC returned. So let's filter by packets with the SYNAC flag set. And just like that, we were able to see the ports the attacker was able to find open. Here we have port 21, 445, 139, and 135. We also have these 49,000 number ports. They're unregistered ports, so it's impossible to know exactly what protocols these belong to, but with a little Googling, you'll see that Microsoft NetBIOS is the top hit. Either way, let's document what we have. Hmm, it looks like we still have a lot more data to come through. We know this is an FTP server, so let's eliminate the obvious and filter out port 21. With that, we can separate the signal from the noise and verify that these are the only open ports the attacker was able to find. And sure enough, this is all we have. There seems to be a few more SYNAC flagged packets in the mix, but looking at the stream ID, those aren't seen until well beyond the attacker's port scan results, which makes sense given how TCP works. You can take a look at these on your own if you would like, 
We will eventually get to them, but following a formal methodology doesn't just mean that you'll get the answers that you're looking for, it also means that you'll get the context of those answers. So in the meantime, these can be safely ignored. Now, let's look at the FTP traffic on port 21. Okay, so this looks like the huge flood of FTP traffic we were told about. We've already seen the traffic that's part of stream 20. That was the port scan we documented earlier. But after that, we start to see a lot of connection requests going straight to port 21. Let's follow one of the streams and see what we can find. Hmm, this looks like a bunch of login attempts. Let's hit the up arrow a few times and check out the other streams. Yep, this definitely looks like a brute force attack. With all of these attempted logins, there's probably a burning question in the back of your mind. Did they get in? So how can we figure that out? Well, we can see these FTP codes like 530, login incorrect. There has to be one for a successful login. Let's check on Google. There it is, FTP response code 230. Let's put that in our filter and see what we can find. Awesome. There's only two streams, and it looks like both of them have the response 230. Let's check them out. Okay, the first one looks like it was still part of the brute force attack. They logged in, but didn't go anywhere with it. Now, let's look at the second one. We can hit the down key to go to our previous filter. Ah, this one's a bit more interesting. Here we can see that they logged in with the Anon Anon, then they listed the directory, changed to images, listed the directory again, and downloaded the file called why we can't have nice cat .png. And the server is even so kind as to tell us the exact size of the file, so we definitely want to write this down. Since this is all over the network, we can see the results of each command. Let's hit the up arrow a couple of times and step through the streams. Here we can see the contents of the first directory, the second directory, and then this looks like the PNG that the attacker downloaded. If we didn't know any better, we could look at the first few bytes and match that to a file signature. In this case, PNG files simply spell out PNG in their signature. So that makes it easy on us. Now, something that I want to point out is with real world capture files, it won't always be as easy as pressing the up arrow in the streams list. Sometimes the next stream or the next several streams are actually parts of other traffic. This is why you need to filter packets and list conversations as your first steps when analyzing PCAP files. Another way we can quickly find a downloaded file is to look in the conversations list. We know the size of the file given by the FTP server's response, so all we need to do is find a conversation that has at least the same number of bytes. Then we can filter by that and look at the stream. This is also how I tend to do a quick and dirty analysis of a packet capture to see if there are any obvious files within the PCAP that can be extracted. Okay, now that we've located the file, let's carve it out like we did in scenario one and take a hash of it. That way we can compare the hash against the hash of the original file on the server for integrity. Last step. Let's go ahead and open the file so that we can see what the attacker was able to get their hands on. Well, that's disturbing, but hey, you know what? We're done. Let's hop back to the slides and review what we found. Okay, recap. The attacker sent off an ARP scan of the subnet 192.168.56.0. They were able to find the address 56.1, which was the FTP server we were looking in to begin with, and we also found this address 56.100, which we don't have any traffic, so we couldn't really do any further analysis on. The attacker then started a port scan against the host 56.1 and found several ports, so port 21, 445, 139, 135, and so on. After the port scan, the attacker set off a brute force attack and was able to find the credentials Anon Anon. And with those credentials, they were able to download a file, why we can't have nice cat.png, and we were able to carve that file out of the network bytes, and we have a sum of the file to compare to what's on the server. Well, that's all I have for you guys. If you managed to stick through this far, I just want to say thank you. NetSec is a passion of mine, and I'm just glad to have the opportunity to share this with you. 
Now, I don't want to let you go empty-handed. Here's a few resources that I use to get started, and a few more that I still use to better my own skills. Some of the ones that I want to point out here are ForensicContest.com, HoneyNet.org, and MalwareTrafficAnalysis.net. ForensicContest.com I cannot recommend enough. This is the group that runs, or at least used to run, the DEF CON Network Forensic Challenges. Their online puzzles start off pretty easy and then slowly build to incredibly complex challenges. Hands down, the best place to start here. Next, HoneyNet.org, I would say, are more intermediate and advanced level challenges. They'll require you to do some of the same stuff we did in here, plus a little bit more malware analysis on the end. Finally, if you want a real-world challenge, check out MalwareTrafficAnalysis.net. This blog is almost exclusively real-world attack traffic, and you're going to really need to think outside of the box sometimes to find what you're looking for. If some light reading is more your thing, here's a few books you're going to want to check out. Practical Packet Analysis, another great resource for beginners. Once you're finished with that, Network Forensics Tracking Hackers Through Cyberspace is a good one to bump up your skills to the next level. This one was also written by the DEF CON Network Forensics people. If you want to learn how to use these techniques into your current incident response process, check out NIST Publication 886 as a guide to integrating forensic techniques. And then, of course, the file signature database that we used earlier, GaryKessler.net. Well, again, thank you for taking the time, and I hope you learned something new. If you like this workshop, series, or whatever you want to call it, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Also, let me know if there's a particular NetSec topic you'd like me to cover next. Who knows, I might make a video of it. Anyways, check out the links in the description below, and don't forget to like and subscribe to see more videos like this. I'll see you next time.